Granny used to tell me all the time Sparks when feet and preparation combine The road been right here all this time But you gotta look with more than your eyes And the small axe Jesse Ryle representing for I Just Star Mindset Rich forever Blessed love, pleasant, good evening, warm welcome mindset program. I just start my host and I want to greet the item in the divine name of Kadamawi Aili Selassie I, Empress Menin the First. Warm welcome in those beautiful and divine name, one more day above ground and we give in thanks and praise for life as the item know life is our ultimate position no matter what I go on on top of water go on seeing um today we have a very special guest and you know i'm honored you know to have this um matriarch patriarch elder you know on the program on the platform today zin um is a is a rastafari empress zin elder um that has been chatting you know rastafari from the mid 70s um she go by the name of mama dr desta zane and you know she she hold uh, a doctorate in law and you know she 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 been doing so much work you know for the movement of rastafari and as I said, I'm honored to, to have Mama Desta and the Mindset Program today all the way from Ethiopia. Mama Desta, warm welcome. And yes, Ling, and greetings in the name of the Most High, Kadamawi Haile Selassie from Addis Ababa, <laughs> Ethiopia, brother, I just star. Give thanks and order. Yes, Mama Desta is... Um, it's an honor and a privilege, you know, to have the eye here and, and, and the platform to to reason and, you know, to share your experience with um, the world at large. Give thanks for taking the time. Yes, I give thanks. You know, well, everything that we are doing is um, not of a personal nature. So while I'm really not one to do a lot of, so, well, I'm not on social media at all for that matter. But I, I will do as much as um, other platforms where we have the opportunity to engage in reasoning and, and education of what work is happening here on the continent. Because if we don't connect it, you know, then we're basically working in a vacuum and um, in, in a spirit of futility. And that's not what's happening at all. So again, I give thanks for your platform. And I do try to listen as, as you know any occasion that I get so again give thanks for bringing the diverse voices and um, reasoning to the Rastafari and the greater black community you know because this is what this work is about you know it's black liberation so what we're doing is for, for all people of African ancestry yes mama Desta give thanks give thanks I, I totally agree with the I and you know Give thanks, so you know, to tune in in more while, you know, when there I can, you know, I'm honored. Give thanks. Um, yeah. let, let me ask the idea still. Uh, when, when, you know, as a as a young woman, what, what was it like for the eye growing up in in Jamaica in the you know in the sixties and seventies coming up? Well, life, life was sweet. I was a little girl from uptown, Hayden Dale, Meadowbrook. <laughs> um, went to the school at St. Richard's um, of Red Hills Road, but I was an uptown girl, you know, dance and dance with my school and theater, little theater. And it, it was just an incredible 
life and experience very sheltered um mom was in you know the typical migrant story mom in america working hard to send for me and my siblings and other family members for the quote-unquote better opportunities especially at a time where you know certain violence and, and things are beginning to shift in the country um past the, the independence period so you know my, my life was really nice and even though i moved to america pretty young 11 years old or so um the the the, the shock made it mandatory that every summer i would go go back to jamaica um for for the holiday for the for the summertime See it. and growing into my teens i would spend a lot of time especially with my cousin the greens a very famous lady musgrave house road there on the corner with uh, judge tony green and my cousins ingrid and <laughs> you know playing in the yard very famous yard where enough of us would gather so it was a very lovely experience until you know um consciousness set in and that was really tweaked um moving to the united states you know so but Jamaica life as a child, all my memories are, are fond memories from the food to the family, um, you know, what, what Jamaica was in, in that time, you know? See, um, I, 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 I know they are, um, based on your, your, your bio, um, it's, it's showing me that you were born in um, 61. Um, yes. Do you recall um, when His Majesty visit? Do you do you remember yes, anything I at do. all? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you mentioned I, I I was probably five at the time because that was me. So it was a little before my birthday, but while I don't remember, as some would say, going and seeing him and all of that, I remember my grandmother yeah. getting us ready and saying we had to have a nap and you know, it was afternoon kind of early time, unusual. You know, and getting tidy. I just remember that this this little man. I remember those two words. This this little man, this little African man, is coming. This special man. And I remember for years, uh, red, gold, and green line of Judah flag being in my grandmother's Bible. You know, mm. um, I still have this the Bible now, and it's an actual Maccabees Bible. Wow. But I remember the occasion and the moment. But to say see him and all of that, no. But um, yeah, it's still an exhilaration when I think about it, you know? Yes, I powerful, powerful. <laughs> and and, and the I grandma wasn't a, a, a Rastafari, was she? No, not at all. However, her third or fourth time, my grandmother had six children and she was the main one that um, took care of us in Jamaica when my mom was in the u.s again working hard to bring us there so you know jamaican families um extended it's not just mom dad two children and a dog you know so yes. we have a grandmother auntie uncle um and so one of my uncles my mother's brother um was indeed a young ras in the early days and he used to run with count Ossie. and he went by the name of mystic and so my grandmother was quite familiar through the troddings that she went through with my uncle john who again his name was mystic okay. called mystic and so it was interesting he mentioned that it was count ozzy that recommended my uncle kind did notice certain thing um go abroad and be become a sailor actually and have the opportunity to go abroad and work and help the family that would have been in the late 40s that's the early 50s actually 50s you know so my grandmother would tell me stories when i start to cite rastafari maybe in the ninth tenth grade that and this is in america now we don't know not about rasta you know and rasta is the cleanest man on the earth if he's eating a dirt floor the dirt is clean you know she would always go on and on and on about the integrity and how we didn't know what real rasta was Wow. Again, this is in America now, and I think to you think you know this is New York, and the reputation that Rasta have in the seventies. Can you imagine? You know, so in her mind, she's really comparing us to to an authentic, original 
man of integrity you know rastafari um what what why why did i migrate to the u.s in the early 70s was it um for better opportunities well it was because mommy said it was time to move <laughs> you know and uh, as a minor um as i say you know at, at that stage you know you just under your parents authority it was difficult because we're leaving everything that we know our whole family and everything um as we know it but of course there was that excitement of being re reunited with our mom um and things so uh that essentially though in terms of better opportunities was um my mother's um impetus like most of the millions of i and i parents and grandparents that migrated whether it be windrush or you know new york toronto whatever during that period between you know especially the mid to late 1950s and 70s yes i yes i give thanks and 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 when did I sight of um Rastafari? I, 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 I said from about ten grade. Um, which year was this? Right, and well, you know, I, I think I have to tell a little bit about the journey because it's interesting. Um, how I I sight Rastafari. Now, as a, I I was an only girl amongst brothers and male cousins so i was a bit tomboyish so <laughs> there was always this quest to take off that edge <laughs> you know and so um one of the things in jamaica would be, they would send me during the summertime i'd have to go to the portman school where i learned to walk and talk and eat with all these different knife and fork and you know, um, deportment school, right? And then in America, now I was sent to this modeling school on the weekends. But the modeling school was in Harlem on 125th Street, which was in the middle of an exploding black culture. See. Because by now we're talking 75, 76. So I, I was an avid reader, just, I mean, inhale books, love books. And there was this African-American bookshop called Tree of Life right on the corner of, I think, 125th and Lenox Avenue. And I would just go in there and just gobble up the books, you know, whatever little pocket money I had, buy the books or just spend time in there reading and just being in that environment because within a, a four block area, you would have Nation of Islam. You would have the, the remnants of the Black Panthers. You would mm -hmm. have... You know, you'd cite one or two rats. They weren't as popular in Harlem then, you know. Um, you'd see um, the, the black Hebrew Israelites, a Saraset, all of this. So it really piqued my interest juxtaposed to the experiences that I was having since moving to America, being in, a, in Mount Vernon, New York, is Westchester, you know, going to a Catholic school, all white people teasing you ask if you come off a boat you know these kind mm. of ridiculousness so it was actually a wider pan-african experience and i started reading even literature um langston hughes and donald goines and um claude mckay um so so the books and that experience is really what opened up this pan-african portal and sort of way of coping with the anger that was building inside of me and the resentment I was beginning to feel um, based on this racism. I see the, the, one of the difficulties was coming from a family where, you know, teeth with my knife and fork, I come from uptown and certain things and that one would call you come from class. And see. then these particular Muzungu European descendants that I'm here now with are so racist but so uncouth and so uncivilized mm -hmm. yet still challenging my civility at every turn you know so it was complex and you know our parents and I'm sure I'm not the only one that went through this as that generation because what happened now our parents are working hard to put food on the table and make this better way for us and basically the philosophy is 
just don't stir up no trouble. Just work twice as hard, have your grades twice as twice as good, and you know, suck it up. In other words, there um, was no real analysis to understand. You know. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh marginalized black woman was um, in 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 that time in the Americas. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think there was a spectrum because back then was when all those black exploitation movies was coming out, right? Mm -hmm. Superfly, Cleopatra Jones, and that was one of the things that we would do on, on weekends is go to these, you know, what they call them, black exploitation movies. So you have on one hand stereotypical images of, of black baby mamas, welfare mamas who are again look down as either housekeepers or whatever mm. and then on the other side of it again cleopatra jones and these other images that are also you know presented in the movies but they're still objectified in a sense it's still never really looking you know unless you're in the cultural community and that's again the benefit that i found in going to harlem because you had indigenous groups that were upholding Kwanzaa and um, there were alternative black schools. So you still had pockets of that experience. And I think those are even residuals of the 60s where, again, black women were beginning, you know, to, 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 to be seen as equals within the black panther struggle within black women struggle civil rights etc but I, I should say this we should always contextualize how the black woman is seen because what i'm talking about now is something new and contemporary but we know the history of the black woman we have served as pharaohs we have served as 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 as, as warriors we've served as empresses we've this is what our history is. This interruption over the last couple of hundred years is where we're having problems mm. reconciling not just our identity, but how we are seen and treated within the context of, of black womanhood. So I think this is always very important to understand when, you know, again, I'll use that word context a million times because I think it's important. Many times we think we're saying the same thing or speaking about the same thing. And this is where miscommunication comes, you know? Yes, I. Yes, I. I know I asked the, I, I, a question in the I am um, telling the story about um, um, arriving at, 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 at Rastafari. So I just wanted to remind yes. you so that I could continue <laughs> on the story, you know? Give thanks. Yes, give thanks for that. I do appreciate the reminders. Yes, <laughs> um, you, you know, uh, so to continue through that experience now and sort of becoming conscious of being black because I, I did not know I was black because in Jamaica, as a child, that is not an issue, mm. you know. Yes, once in a while, you, you know, you go to Dunsborough Falls or you go to beach and you see a white person that red like loves or whatever, but you still don't even know this context of white and, and black. Yeah. Um, you know, class more than anything. So I was not aware. So once this portal opened up now, I, and again, I mentioned Dunsborough because it was there where we were in the water and there was this tall well i shouldn't say tall because i was young but um was a, a rasta man and he liked me but even more so because my father is the first generation born outside of india in jamaica and on my mother's side is the west africa line wow. but it marveled me to see someone with that type of hair with long locks because as children you know we would see rastaman we never was afraid of them but of course we used to hear you know um black heart man and three wheel coffin all these all different the kind of things yeah. to scare you. but it, yeah it never really scared me for some reason i like i say you see the rastaman them with a push cart or whatever so it wasn't but this this rastaman it, it fascinated me that is locks you know, you could see the soft hair. And I remember asking him, how, how you get your hair like that? 
you know, and I remember the smile, he just smile at me, he didn't even answer, <laughs> <Just smile. laughs> and, and again, this was an important part for me because coming out of, and we'll discuss this later if, 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 if the opportunity arises, but yes, sir. coming out of my heritage, although I never raised with the Indian sites, I don't know anything about Indian culture or anything like that from the Megu side. Um, but it fascinated me as, you know, I had soft hair as well. And we always see Congo and, you know, dreadlock. So again, that was an important milestone. Um, but when I came back to the States after that summer, I really started putting two and two together, you know, and, um, this one song, no name, precious name, no name, Jarastafari, just it just started resonating, resonating. And then, you know, classmates, I had one or two classmates. But by now, actually, this was junior high when it started to sow. Junior high school, come to think of it in the Bronx. Um, you're bringing me back, I just started. You're taking me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was saying nine, third, tenth grade, but actually it was junior high. And Karen, um, a good sister of all, so, you know, she started telling us certain things i noticed she was dressing different and you know exposing us but like i said for me the immersion or the confirmation i would say it's probably the latter part of the ninth grade you know See. the latter part of the ninth grade where uh, it's like yes this is who i am this is who i'm going to be <laughs> rastafari <laughs> and here i'm 45 that. years how much is it? No, 61 minus whatever <laughs> Yes, I give thanks, honorable. Um, talk to me about the relationship that um, they are had with with Naya being the elders, such as Ras Bonerjees, um, Ras mm. Martima Plana, and um, Ras mm. Sam Brown, and also the political influence. And okay. did they endorse? bad man thing within the movement all part thing may ask there at one time but yeah 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 well, well let's start with the last part which is sometimes the elephant in the room yeah um and and one of the things that we within rastafari would like to deny mm -hmm. um there has always been an element of quote-unquote bad man around rastafari and Around. we can even, those who are of the Bible, and, and I'm going to flesh it out, right? Yeah. Those of us who are of the Bible, you know, uh, um, reader, then, you know, line, would know the story of Peter Simeon, the swordsman, right? And that there is always some type of warrior within the midst. True. Um, okay, so that's that's the first thing I want to set. And and what is the persona of the warrior in the midst? Overprotective, overzealous, um, not as rational, quick to anger, right? Mm. But an essential part at some times within the greater framework when we're talking about revolution. So be it revolution of Yeshua the Christ, who was then within a framework of, of, of sharing a new consciousness, right? Um, um, which is still it was still about liberation, um, or the rising of Rastafari. See. And so these ones I think had two roles or relationships that I observed. And know about firsthand um, within Rastafari. The first was the notion of they really did see um, some of those who we had considered them the bad man, them, the gun man, them, you know, because I think we need to be very clear. And maybe because of the format, I don't know if we can use that word so we can go forward to the bad man, but um, these ones who seem to serve both um, masters, right, um, did indeed embrace 
the black theology, the black liberation movement of Rastafari, because it gave them a sense of strength and connection that is part of the reason why they were even in the position that they were in. Um, how did they get these guns? How were they usurped into this? Because Jamaica, I mean, I haven't lived there in a while, but I know back then there was no gun factory. True. And I don't remember ever seeing a gun shop. You know? Um, so why were these ones now, these young brothers who many of them, some of them ended up even using that power of the arms to create the garrison communities, protecting elders, you know, allowing children to go to school, making sure light go on. We know garrison life and the politics and how it's mixed up in it, right? Mm -hmm. But in the context of Rastafari, these ones, and again, I'm doing a bit of psychoanalysis now, having spoken with some who, again, you look in their eye when they talk of Rastafari and the majesty, you see the love, you see the humanity, you see the humanity in them. But in a flicker of an eye, you can also get a cold stare that you know, so that one there will, you know, um, it, it won't end well. Mm. So we have to ask ourselves now, what do we or how do we put them? No, we can't endorse. We will never endorse anything that goes against what the majesty has set an example and showed us and he has showed us our humanity he has showed us that life is valuable he has showed us that we take up arms and defend if our sovereignty and integrity is in jeopardy because he's not afraid right mm -hmm. to take up arms this is part of our responsibility and duty is defense we must defend but defend and offense are two different positions so you know in a nutshell no this is not something that was ever condoned and i've seen the ancients you know some of them in, in certain moments giving counsel and the humility within these ones that we would call you know the bad man but no no endorsement none at all without any apology as as um, as as the movement hmm. lost that militancy um over the passage of time um well, I, th I i think in a sense that's a different question because when we're talking about Bama, we're talking about certain ones that we know what they do and have the capacity to do and why they do it mm. in terms of militancy you now for instance, when we did the 1988 trod as a New York um, committee of races, right, to bring the first delegation of elders um, in May 1988, we had a security wing, and it was it head, headed up by Ras um, Oba Oba Dai, as a matter of fact, who is in um, Saint Saint Nevis, the islands. Um, anyway. Um, we always had that contingent, you know, and I remember even Scott's past in the early days too, there was always a lion on the gate, or, you know, this kind of thing. So I think that militancy, as you're speaking of that level of protectionism, it has been displaced. It's not gone, but it's been displaced now to inner aggression against one another. We don't use that now to protect our community our women, our children anymore, our elders. We are now using that aggression against one another. Um, in some cases, this is not an absolute situation, but in some cases, this is what I have ob observed, particularly over the last three decades. Wow. Wow. Serious. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I did ask the IR. So the so. question... <laughs> Go on. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Yes, I know, beloved. So where the relationship is concerned now, um, you know, I, I I certainly do think that um, these ancients played a major role in my life and it was unexpected for me. First of all, I come from uptown, 
never went to the ghetto a day in my life until I was in my 20s. And a small time planner called for me to, to come and I, I went out to Jamaica and met with the man thing. I went to Barbican where I was able to live on the standpipe. And, but I, I, you know, and then father coming from India, my name is Negu. Um, just a, a lot of things um, that I did not push myself up on because I respected the order, I respected the principles of the order, including that of black supremacy, what's, what that, that spoke of, not superiority, but supremacy in terms of supreme love, mm -hmm. the supreme creator of all from which all things have flown. So I overstood my... Well, I thought I did. I, I, I learned so much because of them. Again, the, the, the Indian um, Hindu line uh, um, made me humble, but they identified me from quite early um, in the works and were very frank. One thing I love, they were very frank, very, um, very so word, um, demanding. <laughs> 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 you know um, and also very sensitive they had a keen overstanding and let me speak about Ross Warner G's first because each each of them it's it's so uniquely different you know Ross Warner G's again it was more around the theocracy in order and morality and, and, and how we carry ourselves and how we move and why we must move in a certain way and he was quite harsh. You know, I, I've, I've divorced twice. Um, and uh, he, he was harsh. But when I unpack it, when I unpack it, and I, you know, think back at the letters, because he would even write the letters, you know, with wise counsel and which chapters to read and this kind of thing. He was very protective. Because at the same token, he was advising me on what I should be doing, you know, within the movement and how to carry myself if I'm doing this as a woman, if I'm doing that. And and it was never um, chauvinistic. It was never chauvinistic. And I always overstood the principles. You know, he was the first one that asked me to make a presentation in front of the altar within the living. If the woman doesn't do that, you know didn't do that and so um i think nana farai may have been one of the first women to to have that that privilege that honor but i still stage rastafari yes i i don't know something as um the line blessed love Mm, look like we're getting some form of disturbance. Um, we're here reasoning with um, Mama Dr. Desta all the way from out of Ethiopia. See? Um, if they are them could please push that like button. We would, um, would give a thanks. See? If they are them could please push that like button. All right, while we um, we connect with um, Mama Desta again, Rastafari. Yes, Mama Desta. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, man, I can hear the eye loud and clear. Okay, I'm hearing you now. I couldn't hear you before. Yes. Yes, I. Okay, so shall I continue? Yeah, man, please do. Okay, good. So, again, Ras Bonagis, that, that was really important. And you see, when you are doing some of the work, like what, what now Ron Kumi, Ras Mortimer Plana and Ras Sam Brown were on which were dealing with indeed political governmental works, mm -hmm. that foundation was extremely important. Um because it's very easy when you move into the space of government work, political work, if you don't have moral stamina to be swayed. And it's very easy because political arguments are convincing. Mm. For instance, if someone says to you, okay, um, for the good of this hundred, this 50 here, Africa suffer. 
it's difficult, but you are not at the table having to make a decision when you really do have another option. This is where the moral code comes in now to say no. That means nobody don't stop until we find a way to figure it out that all 150 is clear, you know? True. So that's where the morality um, foundation, you know, really came in in the charge where um, plan again, repatriation, repatriation, repatriation. Um, what do we have to do to get that done? Government to government, setting up administration. So he really was key um, on that and also documentation, documenting our history. Um, how he called me, he had great concerns about Carol Yarny, and I had already known about her as Sam Brown and others. You know, she was infamous, infamous um, researcher that um, dug deep into the community. And um, anyway, that's another story. But that was his question, and I'll never forget him saying to me, she is like a monkey on my back. And in the African-American context, that was a saying in the 19... Um, 50s particularly, 50s and 60s, to describe heroin addicts. Let's say you have a monkey on your back. In other words, you're addicted. Mm. You know? And so he was clear and honest about what she was doing and wanted me to kind of intervene. But I didn't feel prepared at that time. I had even left university because I was first doing pre-med and left university. So I wasn't even finished with my bachelor's degree or anything and I didn't feel equipped to go into that realms and I also felt very cautious about those ones um, because I was a bit conservative within Nyabingi. I was one of those that didn't feel it should be taped, um, recorded while it was going on. If you want to set up a special session to record it, fine, but I felt that sacred Mm. Um, space should be respected as sacred. So I was a bit old school and not really convinced, but nonetheless, I took counsel and 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 reasoned. Um, and so, a lot of the work that I'm doing in terms of the policy part and looking at how we really make the connection for repatriation has been motivated by him. And our last reasoning was on that level when he asked, you know, so what you know, bring me home. Now come to Ethiopia, you know, and upon having the discussion about passport and visa, his response, I didn't leave Africa with a passport or a visa. You know, See. and as I mentioned to um, um, Albert and Jaboni a couple of days ago, um, as he knows, those who were amongst the ancients, they spoke in code, almost parables, not almost in parables. And so while it wasn't direct instruction, this was also part of the test of I and I as, as students, as sons and daughters, to, to decode um, what the challenge was and, and how we prepared to, to find a solution, you know. And so anytime we did come back with a solution, um, it, was, it was met well. And that's where Brother, Brother Sam Brown comes in now because... He also keenly overstood politics and understood the importance of the economic structure. Mm. You know, particularly after doing the Rita conference, that was, I believe, 81, and Empress Masani out of Canada, which doesn't get enough props, but really in terms of women within Rastafari who are trailblazers and continue to do the work, you know, um, Sister Masani, Empress Masani is certainly one, but what came out of that was the 22 point resolutions and it all hinged on a proper economic system so in 1994 myself, Ras Aibo Priest Doggy, Ras Abraham Ras Sambo, um, others um, embarked on a set of gatherings that would eventually lead us into um, Ethiopia, uh, you know, I think after five years, but it was all accompanied by something called the Red Pages, the Rastafari Economic Development Directory. So that was published in 1994. And Rassam Brown really was a, 
proponent of guidance of me. We went through enough fire. Right, me directory and our ancient say me have to break down every word why it has to die why it has to you know? <laughs> but I took counsel to take the fire um, but to this day and we published it I think for three years after that um, it is still a mainstay of the first compilation of Rastafari owned and operated businesses organizations etc around the world including a solidarity section that was for non-Rasta, but black, and that was the criteria, you know, African ancestry. So these are, again, three examples of the application of the school and the education and the influence I received from, from these three particular ancients, among others, Bongo Time, Bongo Tony and I were very close. Ma Shanti was very dear, Mama Baby, I called rocky you know um but these three i think um certainly i had a lot of intense training from rastafari give thanks yeah man you know for for i and i elders you know who have paved the way and um have have done so much you know for the movement yeah. and, for and, I, and i should say this you know my brethren Mm-hmm. It wasn't about quantity, but it was about the quality of time because I did not live in Jamaica. I was living in the United States. So my contact by phone, by letter, by visits were few and far in between. I don't want to paint a picture that, you know, it, it's something else. But the quality when they, when, when we did, you know, if they came to the States and they'd stay with us and, in my home and this kind of thing so we did have that deep relationship but i treasured the rarity of it and i think that's one of the things those that have had the opportunity to basically live and grow up with um these ancients we have a great duty to document their works and look at the application of their teachings in in this time and only wish we could do did because they didn't have the resources they didn't have no phone no cell phone all this kind of thing you know so um i'll continue to really read our ancients and always protect their integrity and and their reputation you know what they have done um it, it, it is equal to impossible Rastafari. it is equal to impossible <laughs> what, what they did um and and i only hope and pray that by the end of this first century of Rastafari, that we, as this sort of second generation coming out, um, can can make them proud, whether they are with us or as ancestors. Yes, I give thanks. Um, there, there I speak about speaking in code earlier. Um, do you think there are agents um, within Rastafari movement seeking to infiltrate and create disturbances um define for me when you say agents what you mean i'm 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 talking about people who don't see um don't see how can i put this people who who don't want to see the movement of rastafari flourish you know those type of people I, I would call agents you know they, they mm-hmm. come and they this that you know they bring all different type of narratives yeah. and 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 stuff yeah. same okay so yeah i just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page i i did oversight but like i said context for me you know and Is these words can be very broad you know yeah um i know without any uh and, and they know too, you know, Babylon has made it clear and know that geopolitics has shifted. We saw what happened during the COVID time. Um, we just heard the head of the EU call EU Europe a garden and everywhere else a jungle. Speaking, of course, we know about us. Um, we heard the comments. We understand clearly. We see the treatment of black people, of Rastafari. And I'm speaking now of black rasta i know that is a thing now the last couple decades that we have a lot of you know um others who have taken this on but i'm speaking of what i know because i don't know the others experiences 
Yes, sir. Um, it is clear because our philosophy is not just against neo-colonial capitalistic uh, agendas, but it is pro-love, it is pro-peace, it is pro-justice. And those three things go against the grain of capitalism. What can you sell where peace is concerned? I mean, I can sell you a bullet during wartime right mm -hmm. so what do i where is my benefit if you know love love peace and justice prevail so definitely um there is that uh framework out there and it's well calculated um and rastafari come within the context of black and of african and so as long as africa is under siege and black man is under siege rasta is under siege naturally and even more so because we have proffered a formula right we have the antidote <laughs> to babylon right Child, yes, we, we 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 have it we we know it we have articulated it and so in that context we are indeed um, a threat that instead of their typical um, extermination, which is usually part of the, the process, as we saw with Carol Gardens and other mm -hmm. things, um, capitalists saw, oh, we can actually make some money off of these people mm -hmm. and their principles and their core ideas hence the multi-trillion dollar industries of what marijuana mm -hmm. natural food or what they call vegan or whatever yeah. and natural hair put those three together the three things that we are identified for for the most part trillion dollar industry while we are still incarcerated our husbands sons been still incarcerated and and harassed right over the plant um i had children in the 70s 80s and 90s that were ridiculed for them tofu sandwich and what them wearing and what them how them here in napier now that's the big thing mm -hmm. you see so we have played the role of a sacrificial lamb and not taking advantage of our position because we have pursued um a dangling shiny object cloaked in our own verbiage of one love mm. and let me unpack that a little more go on while we have been speaking from the context of pleading humanity to say one love to the heartless loveless people that subjugated us to racism discrimination and all forms right of 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 degradation and modern day slavery that, that's that was our message just trying to plead to their humanity they have flipped it on their heads now and children of the vikings and others now taking on rastafari wearing the locks even moving to africa and twisting the narrative to even his majesty's speech that was made at the united nations in 1963 that bob marley turned into a cell until the philosophy that was one race superior it wasn't about interracial couples no time <laughs> it wasn't at all. about that you understand yes, it was I. about angola mozambique south africa it, it it was a political statement as a government head of state spoke also pleading humanity so all we get switch up now into a song for interracial love uh, you, you know so these are the things that have been twisting and turning but guess what we open the door but we take responsibility mm -hmm. we fly the gate open just like our ancestors did on the continent you know when the portuguese ships arrive when the british ship arrive when the dutch arrive we fly the gate come on in Oh, you have a trinket? Oh, that book? Oh, we's loving people. But it has to stop now. It has to stop now. 
because we realize that once again, all love is not overstood. Because if any non-African Rastafari had a shred of humanity in them, a shred of humanity, it would have shown over the last couple of years when Ethiopia the last two years was fighting for its life and its liberty and its sovereignty. We never hear one white Rasta will come from outer road, plead to their heads of state, to their parliament, to their anything. You understand? I don't see one of them all a hunger strike in a Belgium, in the Paris, in none of them. Ethiopia stood up again like we did with Adwa. And I have to hold it until we we'll make peace. So I, I know that this is an extended um, explanation, but I think it's important for us to overstand the adversaries that we're fighting and that we have external and internal enemies. Mm -hmm. And spiritually right now, there is also something upon I and I that we have to be careful of. You see, we are losing our we are losing that sense that we had. Our spiritual senses were so high, so sharp. And 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 again, this is just my little commentary and observation. But I feel a dullness or a stillness, not sure how to to, to express it, that must be once again shine off restored and replaced back in its in, in its rightful place because we have more power than we give ourselves true rastafari is known worldwide true true you know we are recognized worldwide and that means something that does mean something what shall we do with it now his majesty said when he established 1963 the oau to his brethren now that we finish the job, what shall we do with the tools? And so these agents, no matter what they do, if we have this righteous cause and we come together, agents, them can't penetrate this. Rastafari come in like we are Ethiopia, never been conquered, never been colonized. That is what we should be aspiring to, yes, to sir. ensure that the Rastafari movement is not colonized. Yes, I totally agree with the I. Um, I, I, I was listening um the I and Jabboni uh, platform, I think, earlier today. Um, just, just, just going forward to what you said just now, I think it was very profound. Um, no white rasters um, had, had, had did anything, you know, in their country towards um, agitating for aid our assistance for Ethiopia. And I heard the high earlier um, saying that um, the process of, 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 of getting citizenship in Ethiopia, now white people as, 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 as now getting citizenship off the back of, 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 of Rastafari living in Ethiopia, especially Shashamani, and and the land grant i i just wanted the eye to kind of expound a little bit more on that for me right so um if i may you know i i have to go back a little bit in 2012 please call please so babo mm -hmm. um invited me to a meeting with um brother moody john moody um ewf that was under Meles Zanawi, Prime Minister Meles Zanawi, with his chief of cabinet. And the question was, what, you, you tell us what you want. Put together what you want, because we're not really clear. So many come and they tell us this, they tell us that. As a matter of fact, one immigration officer even said, this is about 2005. We are really confused because Rastas come, they said they were in exile and they're being oppressed, so they want to come home, they want to see what they're bringing their oppressors with them. Meaning those who have interracial marriage or the, you know, of course, we know many of the 12 tribe and so forth, they move interracially, you know. So understanding that um, we presented 
a short draft policy paper with kind of a history and rationale and way forward. 2012-2013, Prime Minister Portia Simpson came, we discussed it with her, said it wasn't moving, so she, you know, um, agreed that she would, you know, share it with um, Prime Minister Haile Mariam Desilin because then Prime Minister Mellis had passed away. And then finally, no, it was um, heavily revised and then put under not the category of citizenship, but permanent residency for foreign national of Ethiopian origin. Very important distinction because Ethiopia does not allow dual citizenship. So if you want Ethiopian citizenship, you have to relinquish you know, anything else. So this allows you to keep whatever citizenship you have and have all the rights and privileges except for that of voting. So this was based on trying to address the issue of the hundreds of undocumented races, particularly in the Shashamani region. And being undocumented, it delayed development. You can't buy land, you can't um, open a business. I mean, it's like anywhere else in the world, right? If you're undocumented. Yes, sir. So this process was really important, particularly for those of us that come home, you don't have the proper resources and all the, the, the well wishes and goodbyes and repatriation farewells that you have and ones will stay in touch. That just goes away after a month. You become forgot. Okay? Uh, so, the, 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 the long of the short of it is that the EWF and the GRDC were at the helm of this um, process with the Immigration Authority. And JRDC, which is basically a 12 tribes organization that does incredible work in Shashamani with the school and um, other social programs there, because their mandate includes non Africans. They extended this to their members. And because they are Rasta and they guidance from the government was for rastas they they got it you see because this is what we tell the government rasta but the draft policy proposal that we did in 2012 speaks specifically to the african diaspora including rastafari of african descent whose ancestors came through the transatlantic slave trade. So that is specific. That is, you know, a specific thing that by the time, I think, 2017, the um, GRDC and others, um, you know, but this is an issue that is of concern and we want to close that loophole because with any law, this is very important. You have to define the group. True. And so just to say, Rasta, you know, I'm still trying to find what is that definition? Mm. So, so that is the situation now. And we are trying to, like I said, close that loophole or get a better understanding. But because the other thing is, you know, you're not trying to break up families. You have a lot of families here, interracial. So if you have a, 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 a black husband with a European wife, you don't want to say, okay, your wife have to go here, whatever, especially if it's an older couple. But there are mechanisms for that because if you, as a man, get it, you can sponsor your wife. So your wife don't have to come under this special um, law that is carved out for I and I who are returning home. So, 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 so that is, I think, another important thing. You know, we're not heartless. You know, but let us not use this mechanism that is to justify our situation mm -hmm. and the only country in the world that recognizes us within this context and is a stepping stone towards repatriation. Let us not soil it with a new narrative coming into who is entitled to this birthright. So that's yeah, I know. Yes, I give thanks for that clarity and clearance. Um People, people look up to Rasta reggae artists, um, you know, for positive message, you know, as you know, some broad, as as you know, in 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 the eye observation, 
do you think some has brought the movement into disrepute based on non-aligned lyrics and you know video content and and so on i don't know how much you pay attention to 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 reggae still but i'm just asking yeah um you know i i i have to go forward again to ras one of G's. Um, one thing that he was clear, I mean, even when he was staying at my home, mm -hmm. we don't play reggae music. We don't play that. We will play bingy because he was for Naya Bingy music as Rastafari music. And when I analyze it, I think we as people, we expect so much much, but yet we want to give so little. I have worked in artists with artists and artist management for decades. Um, now I'm I'm mostly immersed in in the visual arts here in Ethiopia, working with African artists, Ethiopian artists, and um, you know other special productions. But the reason, let me go back to to, to my thing. The reason why I even began working within the music and reggae feel was because it was a platform for activism for me. Mm -hmm. I only worked with artists that had these type of conscious lyrics and and were about uplifting. It wasn't about the people, it was about the message. People is people. But True. if their talent and their gift is to give this particular song or this poem or this this creativity, um let us take it for that. You know, yes, I do believe that all of us need to be accountable. And we do need more, more role models. Without fail, we need more role models for our youth particularly, you know. However, in working with artists for the decades, I also understand the mind of an artist and the creative space that most artists have to live in and work in to give us what we see as these incredible songs that are you know uh, we still listen to decades after decades and so forth the mind of an artist it's you can't figure it out so there is no logic and reason and rhyme sometimes with the things that they do so let us judge them for what they are delivering to us that said um we have to be careful because reggae is not just a far music reggae is a platform you by Rastafari. Re Rastafari music is Naya Bingi. And that is across all of our mansions. All of our mansions. So I think we have to be careful. Now, that said, I think the question we should be asking is what is the role and responsibility of an artist from the economic side? Because they're certainly doing a good enough job with the messaging. Mm -hmm. um, if I may add this from the African perspective, you know, um, Afrobeat has taken off like wildfire yeah. on the continent and almost displaced the presence of reggae. That was the thing, you know, back in the day, we would bring reggae artists in, people would spend a lot of money. No, yeah, but them not getting the crowds that a burner boy and a whiz kid that a Thames and, and, and these artists get. True. Um, and it's not just because of the beat, but young Africans have said to me, Mama Desta, for years, these reggae artists singing about Africa and they don't come home. When they come, they come for three days, four days, they do the, 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 the show, they may take some pictures in a village or with two children and that's it. So what are they doing for Africa? And in their mind, they see reggae artists because they hear the songs everywhere as these rich, not knowing that. And again, working with artists, it's very few of the reggae artists are rich. It's expensive to tour, to take care of them. So even if you have a bag, <laughs> you know, it's not rich to the point that you can really necessarily do some of the things that Africa is thinking you can do. And this is why I, I loved working with Nana Rita Marley because she put her money where her mouth is. She made it very clear to me. And we started working as Rastafari within Naya Bingi. That was shortly after she had given Scott's and we were trying to 
you know, she wanted to formalize the place, everything. But that's how we came together, Rasta Works. And then I started managing her. And her whole thing was, yeah, I go home, you know, yeah, I go home, I have to go home and set the exam. Of, of that so I think it's important for us to balance how we're looking at these artists mm -hmm. but it's not unreasonable if we hold them accountable in the case of you know our, our good son um, Miguel you know Sizzla has made a lot of assertions and um, um, where his position is concerned what he represents and so forth and and um, my thing is okay, good, and you know somebody I'm in touch with. I've you know been in touch with for many many years. Um, my thing is let's hold each other accountable. What is what is your job then? What what can we get you to do? What are you representing? You know, is lights we need? Is uh, if we say we well, have a representative, then let's let's follow through. And um, while that is a sort of obvious example, it's also the examples in our communities. We have a lot of quote unquote influencers, right? Mm -hmm. um, where is the level of accountability? And if they don't want to be accountable, then we as community, as elders, as ones who have certain capacity, just have to continue doing the work because this is not time to sit down and wait. Things are shifting very fast, especially here on the continent. I don't know how much news is getting out, but this is in uh, we know we have gold coins that when this place, the US dollar, Ghana is following the suit. Mali is now made, they just made an announcement that no money into no NGOs, non um, institutions coming in from France when being operation after Monday morning. So there's a wave going on on the continent now of refocus of African solutions to African problems and guess what this has always been Rastafari philosophy so we know who were the burden bearers and put these songs out there whether in reggae songs or, or in our actions because what we were not employed so we were always self-employed no we who were the forerunners when I sit down and just watch it from the sidelines no 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 come in come in musicians come in whoever you may be professionals because it takes all of us you know all of us um to, to to make this thing go to the next step true yes i totally agree with the i 100 percent um reading the i bio it it, it 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 say you are committed to taking care of children and uh the i the i have 10 youths of um your own um what is what is <laughs> what, what, what what is the acronym um d y m d c mean okay so on the first thing um children yeah i i i love revere adore children i learn so much from them i think children are the most fascinating um I use the word creatures, but you know, on, on the face of the earth. As a matter of fact, um, my husband just did a career day at an Ethiopian school here for 200 students, um, several ambassadors, doctors, different ones there. And two of the presenters, a 14 year old and a 15 year old, who just published a book. 15 year old brother wrote a book called The Fundamentals of Airplane Design. He's one flight away from getting his pilot license. And his little sister, who wants to be a cardiologist, published a book called The Anatomy and Physiology of the Heart. 15 and 14-year-old Ethiopian students. And this is the kind of story that is very common here in Africa, actually. You don't hear it out there on the road, but it is quite common. So the children represent the fruits of our labor our desire our aspirations and, and need to be protected and <clears throat> regarded as 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 angels you know um so i i really take that's why I, I love the title mama you know it, it represents that caring nurturing protective spirit because i i think that that is a duty it's a job 
Um, so that and yes, um, ten youths who I'm extremely proud of all ten of them five sons, five daughters, including twins, um, <laughs> identical. And so DYMBC means um, this is the Yishima Betbegu Development Consultancy. So my name is Desta Yishima Bet. My go Desta meaning happiness. Yishima Bet is the the woman or yeah the woman of thousands. Yes, she is a thousand. My bet is like the honored woman of, you know. And so this is the name of my consulting firm. The D has now been changed to another C. It's creating called Creative Consulting. And so we've been a registered company here in Ethiopia since 2005, um, providing services for individuals, institutions, artists that want to use the arts and culture for social development, for African liberation, for the promotion of anything that is going to strengthen um, the continent. So the mantra is developing Africa through the arts. Yes, I give thanks. Give thanks. Um, the, 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 I have repatriated to Ethiopia now uh, a few years. Um, how do I see the collective move? Should ones be you know waiting and you know quote unquote europeans assistance um for 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 returning home should you know should we have that mindset that you know we we we, we have to wait for the you know for the help of people who have brought us here mm-hmm. it's a good question you know and i i i don't like to think in one or the other because i think we end up um limiting ourselves and the possibilities Mm -hmm. so while i would not condone or support quote unquote waiting on europeans because you know i kind of coined this term a couple decades ago called pre-patriation so pre-patriation is the ones like i and the ones that have come before i you know, over the decades that have been laying the foundation one stick at a time, one stone at a time, one one cocoa um, at a time, the pre-patriation process. And that, as you know, is self-funded. That is heavy sacrifice, mm-hmm. um, but, but quite well worth it. Now, what we're doing within the pre-patriation process is establishing precedents. We're establishing, um, you know, marriages, relationships, children are being born here, businesses are being opened, contribution to the social fabric um, of, 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 of the country and so forth. So um, this is all part of the repatriation process that is a government to government um, situation. That said, we would not be here or in this situation if not for a horrible, worst crime against humanity known as the Ma'afa, transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Good. So with that said, now we have the twin repatriation and reparations which are, are necessary to bring back or restore that social order that was disrupted through colonialism and slavery so they must be held accountable and the african union under ambassador quasi corte who was the previous deputy chairperson of the african union uh, and before that the um he served here as the ambassador for ghana to ethiopia he as a representative at the african union presented a paper on repatriation that actually was uh, passed by all the countries. That was done in 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And so there is an instrument at the African Union that member states have acknowledged and agreed to, although I don't think it has been ratified by each country. At least it is their stating this reparations for the continent of africa you see we normally we're thinking about reparations only from one side in terms of 
what happened to us that was taken away. But the continent is where we were taken away from. And because they took the best and so much of it, repatriate reparations is also owed to Africa. And it's also owed to Africa to help in the facilitation of repatriation. And so these are ongoing conversations that are being worked out, overstanding that the repatriation process has taken on new dimensions because we're talking about also the returning home, not just as of us historic African um, children of ancestry, but those who are contemporary, so those who have gone abroad the last 30, 40, 50 years of their own free will to study or in exile or for education, etc. You know, so it's it's a lot that's happening in Africa right now regarding what is called the sixth region. That is what the African Union has designated those out there, outside the borders of the five regions of Africa, being North, South, East, West, and Central, the six regions, so CARICOM, the Caribbean, South America, wherever black people dwell, you know? So with that said, um, again, Europe will have its part to play. Um, and we have to define that clearly. We can't allow the tail to our dog. You know, um, and, and this is what is happening now on the continent. There really is this awakening that's happening. And it's because our backs have been against the wall the last couple of years. Like I said, the war here in Ethiopia, the Megalin, and then, you know, of course, before that, COVID. True. Yes, I. Yeah, man. Yeah, ones of the, um, you know, yeah, be accountable or old accountable. Um, what wh what is it like um working um with the honourable um priest Barisa Babu? One word: productive. <laughs> <laughs> productive. Um, I think the first major project we did together. Um, was to actually bring the African Union CEDO, which is the Citizens and Diaspora Unit, to Shashamani. Because when we speak about the six region and the diaspora and recognition of Africa for I and I, Ethiopia had already set that bar when the Majesty Kadamawi Ali Selassie gave the land grant to quote-unquote, the black people of the West, right, under the um, the, the, uh, the agency, if you will, of the Ethiopian World Federation. So mm -hmm. that is in the 1950s, that recognition and repatriation, you know. The seeds were sown uh, right there. So we thought it was fitting to make sure that the AU came. So there was an event organized and they came out and Chris Paul was, was at the uh, center of that. We've also done the returning home ambassadorial um, conference that was held in Shashamani 10 years ago. Um, again, just really positive. The policy paper that I spoke to about, um, you know, I didn't work with him on the community policing effort. Um, he and Brother Teddy Dan and others um, putting security first really had transformed the landscape, the crime and everything in Shashamani, I guess maybe 12 years ago or so. So it's really been productive, you know, anytime we, we come together and the newest um, initiative, which, you know, we'll be setting up some interviews um, for him and I to discuss within the next couple of weeks is the Ethiopia Rastafari Council, which is a council of elders, artists, entrepreneurs, all Rastafari, either born in Jamaica or born here in Ethiopia, um, that are serving um, just in an advisory capacity. You know, it doesn't displace or anything, anything that anyone else is doing, but based on the lineage or the, let me call it the pedigree within Rastafari that priests 
Spirit so Babo and I have in particular Free Spirit so Babo coming out of the camp of um, Honorable Prince Emmanuel and that teaching and, and those examples and principles and myself again coming out of the Naya Binge, um, those ancients, um, we have a duty and a charge you know, um, it's not just we stop going our ear 45 years. We've been in it and working and gaining the knowledge. So um, working with him is really a privilege um, and, and an honor. You know, there's great respect for each other. We, you know, when we share ideas, things that we, um, you know, that are no are different. We, it, it, it is just really been a very positive, positive experience. And my husband, my king man, who, and it's very difficult sometimes for Ethiopians to overstand us, but they're so tolerant, they're so patient <laughs> because they see the love that we have for Ethiopia, the love we have for the king. So they yes, really sir. are patient, you know? Yes, sir. And so my husband just has so much respect for him. He says, you know, just please, Paul, what he has done and continues to do for the country, you know, particularly out there in the Roma region and Chashtamani that we'll have him here helping um, and strengthening as a chairman um, with us. We, we're looking forward to it. We really are looking forward. And like I said, we have, you know, um, more to come. And matter of fact, please, Paul, and I were reasoning about you earlier today as well. So um, wow, we're, we're excited. I give thanks. And it's, it's very, like I said, it's just very good to work with. You know, from my experience. Yes, I give thanks. Give thanks. Um, the 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 I is currently doing some work with um Addis Ababa University Institute of Ethiopia Studies and Pan African the Pan African Wing. Um, what does that entail? Well, uh, yeah, it's been um about two years now on the project and. The Addis Ababa University was established as Haile Selassie University. It's, they began in the old Gwinnett Palace, which is where the Pan-African Wing is located and the Institute of Ethiopian Studies. Mm -hmm. So it was um, His Majesty's Father's Palace um, initially, and then His Majesty's Palace before he moved to Jubilee, um, Jubilee Palace. Um, and so... The Institute of Ethiopian Studies was established by the emperor also within the Addis Ababa University, which it's called now, no longer Haile Selassie University after the Derg. And um, it was opened in 1963 on the occasion of the inaugural meeting of the Organization of African Unity. So he established this incredible exhibition, ethnographic exhibition on Ethiopia, on Africa, um, so we have been there, the, the, the handwriting, Kenneth Kaunda, Nairiri, and Nkrumah, who visited this space. And this wing, because I've been working, I've curated several shows there uh, at the Institute of Ethiopian Studies. But when I got the call saying, Sister Lisa, we want to, you know, do this Pan-African, first they were calling it Pan-African Corner. I said, no, it have to be wing, because that whole wing of the palace was His Majesty's office. So it's four incredible rooms that are mahogany wood paneled with probably about 25 foot ceilings with herringbone laid wood floors and incredible chandeliers and wow. it's his majesty's office you know so um first thing we did when i went in was to restore the walls the floors and everything we got a couple of grants from the U.S. Mission to the African Union and French Embassy and my company also, you know, contributed our part and, 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 and my husband. And so what we've established is a Pan-African wing that tells the story of Pan-Africanism from the Ethiopian perspective. Because the story of Pan-Africanism can be told from the Jamaican perspective, the American perspective, the British perspective. There's so many perspectives, but the Ethiopian perspective, which is so critical in all of this, is not really articulated. There are several books. Professor um, Kinfe, Abraham Kinfe, um, he wrote a book um, from Adwa to Pan-Africanism, something along that line that I think is one of the few books that really outlines the connections in such detail. And so... What I do is, you know, again, just have this whole narrative that includes incredible 
um, uh, things, treasures, um, and, and objects that are in the institute. Um, things that were used in the Battle of Adwa, shields and Menelik's hat and rifle and so forth, and um, original painting that was done maybe about a hundred years ago, depicting the battle and the agreement. So you know, and then there's an OAU room that shows the development of the OAU and the founders. There's another space that looks at the impact of the emperor in the United States, visit to Jamaica, these things. And then there's a Rastafari room. So in that room, I'm able to curate, again, the story of Rastafari with some selected icons. And we have um, we have um, a robe from Congress that um, was, was sent to us um, in 2000. We used it... Um, because it two years ago um and then we have also mama baby eyes robe from Nyabingi and crown king zeriakov from the 12 tribes of israel so we have these items clothing in there and again just the story picture of prince emmanuel receiving the gift from his majesty in jamaica so it connects for ethiopians you know who yes, we sir. are and how his majesty saw us and then the final room is the actual office um, where His Majesty's um, desk was, where after you go through these other rooms, you come in there. So we have his um, throne chair, his office chair in there, um, clothing items, and, and so forth. So it's really, it's, it's an incredible space. And then we end it with the No More Movement and Prime Minister um, Abbey's Nobel Prize to show that Pan-Africanism is also now, it's not just a historical context, but mm -hmm. it's current and it's futuristic. Because what this Nobel Prize, we didn't ask for that. They gave it to the Prime Minister for his role in bringing Eritrea and Ethiopia together after decades of separation and war and, and animosity. And so this shows the future of Ethiopia remaining or becoming even brighter as a beacon of hope and unity and solidarity being that this is the diplomatic capital of africa so i'm, I'm very honored to be working with the ies team um to put this um uh, together you know uh, brother rubin was very helpful he did provide a couple of things from ewf but that has been one of our challenges the shortage of content we've been asking content and it's been very difficult but we just kind of got a, a crack the other day um I have access back to the national museum now that i had accessed before for some incredible things belonging to the majesty so we're gonna have a grand opening in february for the au summit which will be the 60th anniversary of the oau so you know this is the the work that we're doing there in the pan-african wing it is open to the public because we had a soft opening in May, um, and you know, it gets hundreds of visitors because it's right in the middle of the university. And right now, that Pan Africanism has become a, 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 a go to word and expression here, particularly in Ethiopia, after what we've gone through again, fighting for sovereignty. It's very refreshing to have this, um, this, this space, you know. Yes, I, yeah, man, give thanks. Sound really interesting. And I'll share some pictures with you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Sound really interesting. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would like to to visit. You know them. Them. Um. You know those. You know the 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 university and 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 you know to see. You know for self still. You know because it sounds very interesting. Yes, sir. What they are is doing. Yes, I. I've got one. It's a blessing. <laughs> yeah, man. It's 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 really um. A blessing for us out here also in the diaspora um what the is you know is doing there you know it's really imperative and you know inspiring i must say i've got one final question for the eye mama desta i know we kind of uh, have superseded over the the time span that we had arranged but um the, the the eyes are so a, a dual citizen um are a citizen of of ghana um what 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 was your thought on the, the the year of return 
I think that was about 2019, around about, I think. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes. Well, you know, um, anything that's going to bring us home to Africa, I love it. It may not be 100% um, as we would like, and we can always find fault with anything. But um, again, anything that's going to bring us home, I'm for it 100%. Um, and certainly because, as I mentioned before, in 2012, Priest Paul, Priest Paris Obabo had convened the Returning Home Ambassadorial Conference in Shashamani. Mm-hmm. So we had set some goals there um, that included initiatives like this. So to be able to see this seven years later, whether our efforts were synchronized or not Mm. it goes to the aspiration of africa at this point and our role here because we have been the agitators we have been the ones saying not don't just look at us as a dollar sign we were sold when we were sent out don't look at us now for our remittances and what we're bringing back but look at the moral obligation and duty you have for the restoration of our birthright Mm. so i think um the year of return for Ghana um, had great possibilities. And it was also for, for, for ones like me, when you mentioned my Ghanaian citizenship, it's important to understand, again, we spoke about precedent. In 2013, Nana Rita was the first one, single one, to get her Ghana citizenship. And it was kind of an easy thing even though she may not have been there as long as some of the others for instance we had like dr milano who was actually the architect of the 2016 um um when i got my citizenship with 34 others but the point is nana rita got hers in 2013 that now paved the way for us with the assistance of ambassador again quasi quarte who i mentioned before um to come in now with dr Malano and put this policy in place for 2016 where the 34 of us got it and then it was formalized so now it's something that happens every two years or so and i previously served as the liaison to the african union for the diaspora africa forum which is based in ghana and they typically get to nominate several names so i was able to nominate before i departed from from daf um a month or so ago uh, um you know a couple of ones rasses um, that were there as Kashawn Myers with Havisha, he and his wife, you know. So um, it's it's a joy. Anything that we bring us home, make us not find fault with it. Make us just look for a way <laughs> to get yes, home by any means yes. necessary because this is home. Malcolm X said, if a kitten is born in an oven, he asked the question, is he a biscuit? No, he's a kitten. So he even though we're born abroad, we are still Africans. We have a right. We have a place. We have a role. You know, we have a destiny. Time to restore those tears, the blood, the sweat that was lost by our ancestors, the ones that made it across that horrific middle passage. Let us not forget what this is all about. This is not just about, yeah, we celebration liberation and these slogans and these rhetoric let us not forget the belly burning the feeling right of our ancestors the sacrifice the whips the lashes even our mothers and grandmothers and fathers and aunties that sacrifice through the process of migration with a wind rush like i said brooklyn you know who left jobs as engineers nurses doctors to go clean people house in america to so-called give us a better way. Let not all of this be in vain because the better way is Africa. And whether that means repatriation of your physical self, repatriation of some of your dollars to invest in opportunities then for your children or grandchildren to come, repatriation of your meditation, your connection, your spiritual connection and your light you know, that beacon 
but let us be mindful of what that process means and how important it is at this time when we see what is happening in the world. If the writing was never visible to us that has been on the wall, it is visible now. Look at what is happening with energy crisis. Look at what is happening, war in Europe. Look at what is happening right outside. And yet still Africa is beginning to rise in a way that Trust me, the time will come when we will be in a position to put sanctions on any country that dare to jeopardize our sovereignty. And we, Rastafari, have been a part of this. We have been architects in this. We have been the burden bearers on this. Let us not lose sight. Let us not forget who we are and what power we hold and that we have already been given authority and validation from Emperor Haile Selassie the first Ababa Janoi, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, conquering line of the tribe of Judah. We don't need no more authority to do the work. So with that, even your work, my brethren, I give thanks for this platform. I am um, this is a long, 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 long interview, <laughs> but you made it go by very quickly. And I know that I have a duty to share, you know, what I'm doing in hopes that it can inspire and let ones know that we are here and we are working and we love, love, love our African community and we know that what is good for Rastafari is good for Africa and what is good for Africa is good for the world. Yes, I. Yes, I. Give thanks. Give thanks, Mama Desta, um, you know, for for taking the time, you know, and for sharing with us. You know, it's it's been a, a great honor and, you know, a pleasure and a, and a, and a joy, I must say. You know, I, I sit down here contented listening to the eye and, you know, I'm, I'm inspired, you know, and I just pray that um, the most I, father and mother of creation will continue to, to lengthen your days and to strengthen the eye and your family and this journey. Um, more love and strength, Mama Desta. Give thanks again. It's an honor. Yes, I give thanks. Rest of our life. Yes, Mama Desta, give thanks. Peace and love and love. all powers and blessing. Rest of our Rest of Give thanks. Love, love. Yes, I. More love. Yes, honorable family. Yeah, that was powerful. Yeah, that was powerful. And all I can say is please like the video please push that like button please share and get this information out there see manners and respect peace and love please reason with us in the comment section and let me know your views and thoughts and what's been said here mindset manners and respect peace and love holy manuel i king Celestia i ja Rastafari, bless and sanctify, sanctify and bless. Introducing to you now a hot reggae song, No Lies by artist Mosiah, available on all digital download platform, Apple Music, Spotify, available now, No Lies by Mosiah, stream now. Subscribe button. See you the mindset. Smash that subscribe button. See you on the next video. I guess start the mindset.